Carter in Nashville on this beautiful sunny day. And thank you, Max, for waking us up with your music. I appreciate that. Uh, Max will be doing a concert along with other jazz performers at the Warehouse on November 3rd. If you're interested, let Pam or myself know, and we're going to reserve a table to enjoy that event. And other announcements. After church today, uh, we have a special guest speaker, Erica, who's going to talk about sources of strength. And uh, it is a great project where they're talking about training in working with youth and helping in suicide prevention and working with those who are struggling and feeling depressed. And this is a great program and the training will be in November. So if you'd like to learn more, please join us in the Mayflower Room. Potluck Sunday is back and we're getting back to uh, signs and shadows of normalcy. And we can celebrate that. So next Sunday, for Halloween, we're doing potluck, and uh, that should be a wonderful experience, so just make a note to bring something to share next week. The following Sunday is fall cleanup, uh, so that's a day where you can come to church wearing your Green Acres clothing.
that's a word we often avoid in church. Money, good old fashioned money. <laughs> we have salaries for our staff of six. We have heating and cooling bills. We have building repair and maintenance. We have office supplies, mission offerings, more and more, just free budget. But I also support the church financially because in doing so, I find that I am becoming transformed myself. As I combine my offerings with your offerings, I know that we, together, are becoming God's hands on earth. I am glad I can join with you in doing this. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeanette, for those wonderful thoughts. And as the ushers come forward, think about what you appreciate about this church and are thankful for, and give us your people.
Join me in the prayer of dedication. Holy One, bless us with the joy of generous hearts and spirits. Let us sense your calling in our lives to share our gifts with the world. Grant us the courage to be disciples of generosity. Amen. The joys and concerns today are so many joys to share, and I want to invite some people to come forward and share a joy. I would invite Reverend Cheryl to come forward and share a joy about the creation. I want to invite Eric to come forward to share a joy about sources of strength. I want to invite Pam Gregory to come forward and share about the joy of singing after two performances. And anyone else who has a joy or concern, come on forward, sit up here, and come on. Don't be shy. Come on. Um, those of you who are wondering why we have this large leafy structure up here, we are reverting to a custom that we did for a number of years under Dave Haper's leadership. Um, this is called sukkah. And about a month ago, our Jewish friends and neighbors celebrated a holy week called Sukkot. Uh, it's a harvest festival. It recognizes God's goodness to us. This is harvest season. And we're going to use our sukkah, if you come up and look at it after worship, there are baskets up there. We're going to be collecting canned veg, canned fruits, and canned cream soups for Catholic outreach. Um, so I invite you to come and be doing this for the next month, and then we'll take those things over. And maybe even go online and read a little more about Sukkot. Oh, yes. It was, it was so wonderful. Our program was about nature. And we started out with a song about a runner who's running through um, a field of grain and, and just how his heart bursts into song. And, it's, it, and it just goes up from there. But it was, um, it was wonderful for me because it was some music that I have never done before which is kind of rare, and uh, it, would, it was just a lot of fun, and the uh, choir was very up about this music, but um, this morning I got a text that one of our altos, her son was, uh, is positive for COVID, and so I think that I would like to request prayers for the community of our choir, the Western Colorado Chorale, and also the audience members who were there. Um, most of the members were masked, most of the people in the audience were masked, but there were those who were not. And so if this is uh, an event where people could get COVID, I just ask prayers that they not get COVID. This week, my entire family had a joy. My granddaughter, who was 36 years old, several years ago announced to her parents she was moving back home to save money so that she could leave this little town where she was teaching and get a job in the big city. Well, they kept waiting. And finally, last August, Kaylee left home and on the 4th of October, she got a job at, she went to New York City, and she got a job um, teaching at Harlem Village Academy, fourth grade math. And she signed a contract, which means she has to stay for a whole year. Her parents are just so happy. <laughs> the only thing is now they have to figure out how they can get all her stuff to her and she really doesn't have a place to live yet because things are tight. So she's couch surfing with uh, two families that she's known since childhood whose sons have moved to uh, New York 
So now we're waiting to see if she can find herself an apartment. She ought to have plenty of money, because after all, she was living at home for almost four years. <laughs> multiple joys in there somewhere. <laughs> in terms of other joys, a great joy in the ongoing battle with COVID happened Thursday night. What happened Thursday night, people? Be aware of what happened. All of the booster shots have been approved. All of them. So there is no longer an excuse not to go forward. And I also want to encourage everyone who got the Johnson & Johnson, please, read the articles and consult with her physicians because they've shown that the maximum efficacy is to have a Moderna booster. So please talk to your physicians about that. And I'm rooting for those who I know have the Johnson & Johnson to please get the best tool available for your future. So peace, shalom, salam. Also just want to give credit where credit is due. Our sort of blunt call to worship was not written by me. I wish it were. Uh, but its actual source is a Tibetan Buddhist teacher that Pam and I met in Cleveland named Gulak Rippenshek. And Gulak has just this great sense of humor. He always says, you should give it to you feel a pinch. <laughs> and, and I didn't ask a pinch where, but you know. <laughs> but it's a joy to share in the wisdom of all faith traditions and people of wisdom. Let us open our hearts live in this global world as we enter into prayer together. Our next hymn is We Cannot Hold the Sun in the Sky. Most of you will recognize the tune. Please sing it.
important executives are being paid full time to create sales for any possible excuse. I'm beginning to think that. We are conditioned to believe, and this is especially true of younger generations, we're conditioned to believe that shopping is how we receive. And on a basic level, it's true. You order something from Amazon, and sooner or later it gets here. When we think of our own life and our own abundance, I'm reminded of a good friend of mine from the last church named Gary. And Gary pretty much had everything he wanted. He was hard to shop for. Anyone in your family hard to shop for? Well, Gary was hard to shop for. So I go to see Gary. He had surgery, and he was in the hospital. Has one of the best laughs on planet Earth. One time, I identified Gary in the hospital. A half, at least a half a football field away, because I could hear him laughing all the way down the hall in a hospital. So I go to visit Gary. And he shows me this unique card that he received. And it was the card that says, for the person who has everything, and it was a gift. It was a gift of a bubble of air for the person who has everything. And it was sent to him by a good friend. If we're honest to look at our own life, some of us are so blessed with most things we need and most things we want, then in terms of being consumers, we don't need much more than a bubble of air. On a spiritual level, I have felt blessed, not simply by what I've received, but also by what you share with others. Have you ever given something to someone who somehow felt somewhere here that the world was a better place? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever offered an encouraging word to someone and then experienced that the, the light of the day seems lighter in your consciousness? Have you ever volunteered to feed the hungry and felt a gift of compassion well up within your own spirit? Have you ever supported a good cause or a good church and felt something more than your isolated sense of selfhood? Maybe, maybe St. Francis was on to something. In giving, we often receive an injection of compassion. And the truth is, these COVID shots are truly injections of compassion for both yourself and others. Somehow that message has not been fully communicated. In giving, we often experience renewed energy, don't we? We feel love working through our very thought processes. In giving, we create a church where decade after decade, we bless new generations. In giving, we can discover that we become more fully children of God. And here's why. Because holding back and turning aside and not practicing generosity makes us smaller in heart and soul and spirit. And we've all experienced this. I haven't met any Scrooges here I haven't met any Grinches here, but let's talk about real life. Anyone ever had a bad experience at a restaurant? You want to have a bad experience at a restaurant? Cold food, lousy service, perhaps a rude waitress. Anyone experience that? Okay, now here's part two of the question, which is the hard part, because I've been I'm guilty in this area. Have we then sort of taking it out on the waitress by shortening the tip a bit. Some of us have. Now, pay up pushing me and says it should be 20%. I typically aim for like 15 to 17%. But I've had bad experiences in restaurants where I've kind of cut it to 10 or 5. I admit that. Anyone 
Anyone else? I'm not going to ask for a raise of hand. Anyone else ever do that? Ever shortchange a waitress? Now I'm going to ask you, in reality, how did that feel? See, the opposite of generosity feels awful. And the truth is, we sometimes punish the waitress when it was the cook we should punish. <laughs> or the owner of the store who short staffed all of the working people. So the problem with the opposite of generosity is it makes us feel less than human. It makes us feel smaller. And I admit that. I have shortchanged the tip because of a bad experience in restaurant. Did I feel better? No. Just make the whole thing a little bit worse. And then Pam would remind me, you should always give 20%. I worked as a waitress in college. They work hard. So we have profits and likes. For some people, and churches are blessed with them, there are people who Give, and it's just as natural as breathing. You've met them. You've rubbed elbows with them. You've sat with some of them. You made me want them. And in every area, we need a space where our generosity is life giving breath. Spirit, Ruach. Preparing myself in Tulsa, it was taking in stray dogs and getting them to a happy home. So we did this with over a dozen dogs that were dumped in various places. Well, we ended up with two dogs our, ourselves because nobody wanted those two. One we gave away to a church member and they gave it back five days later. <laughs> it, was, it was an energetic Belgian shepherd and the dog had so much vitality and energy they took the dog for a walk, and in holding the leash, the dog broke their pinky finger when it ran. <laughs> so we got a return on that one. We had wonderful, many, many years of energetic exercise with that particular dog. I would throw a ball in the park, and Pam would bet, who's going to give up first, the dog's legs or my arm? Most of the time, it was my arm. And then we had another dog who we rescued from living in the wild where it actually consumed duck eggs, bunnies, and other things just to survive. And that dog was always gone, sad. She's still around, 16 years old, named Violet, but she's never been a happy dog. She's always been so, mm. <laughs> you know, some of the sad sack dog. So we were shocked and amazed. We moved here. We like it here. We let that dog go out the first day. It came back in after looking over the yard and everything. And the dog started yelping and jumping up and down at age 16. And the dog is amazing. I've never seen a dog this happy that was this sad. The dog loves Grand Junction. I don't know what's in the air. I don't know what's in the grass. When you turn the sad sack dog into a very upbeat, very happy dog, and Pam and I are both trying to figure this out. So you get a lot of blessing through rehousing pets. How many of you have adopted an abandoned pet? How many? I want to see. Wow, that's more than half the congregation has adopted an abandoned animal. Didn't that feel good? And for some of us, it still feels good. What about the animals with two legs? Anyone ever adopt one of those for a short period of time? Not a family member. Anyone ever, ever adopt a human being for a little while while they're figuring out life? Pam and I did that with a person who was a part of the symphony and she was a victim of domestic violence and needed a place to hide real quick. And it's like, hey. We live in an area where it's not the main drag. Come live with us. And we were so happy when she not only found healing, but became a soloist for the symphony. It became a part where we were rooting for her, and she was impressing us. Another time, 
We adopted a Disciples of Christ minister for five months who put a queen-size bed into our office room and lived there. Well, what was his mistake? He was a progressive Disciples of Christ minister working in a conservative Disciples of Christ church. And one week after he invited John Dominic Crossan to speak in his church, he was asked to leave the church. That shows you how churches are different, doesn't it? Because guess who spoke here? John Dominic Crossan. Did anyone leave the church because of John Dominic Crossan? No. We gave that as a gift to the community. And I have to say, for John Dominic Crossan, he may be a little progressive, but he's nowhere near a radical New Testament scholar. So we had this guest for five months living in our office, and he landed on his feet and became the president of an interfaith organization. So it's a joy to sometimes adopt the people in need for their period of time. Generosity can bring many rewards that you don't expect. So I ask you, is there some truth in St. Francis's plan that in giving we can receive? For Protestants in our tradition, we have a theology of calling, and that means they're not simply the ministers are called to a special mission. It means that God calls every person to use their spiritual gifts. And to use any spiritual gift is to practice generosity, is to practice giving. With our labors, we're called to leave things a little better than we found them. And here's what happens if you start practicing generosity you'll find that your sense of humor about life improves. You'll find that you have a bigger picture of understanding others in the world. You'll find that you can let go of the small stuff because you're living in a larger world. You find that there's a blessing in itself of simply having a generous heart. So I'm going to ask you to affirm that as we envision in our life, who was the most generous person in your life? Name them. I don't have to hear through the mask, but name the most generous person in your life. Who were they? My dad. Your dad. Father Jerry Anderson, my in-laws. In-laws? You were lucky. <laughs> Your mother made a stewardship talk this morning. Oh, you just embarrassed her. Okay, good. I'm just speaking the truth about you getting back. All right. All right. Thanksgiving's coming. <laughs> My partner. Your partner, yes. Mary Green. Mary Green. My reverend from um, UCC um, Church many years ago. And 
the Pope was Pope Sixtus II, who Valerian executed. So it wasn't safe being a Christian in the Roman Empire at this time. And the deacon, Deacon Marx, he realized that after the Pope had been executed, he was near the top of the list. And his job was, as deacon, was the outreach, okay? Mission and outreach was his job. So what he did was he took all the resources they had, saved up in their budget, and gave it to the poor, the disabled, the weak, the needy, the orphans, the widows, to support them knowing that this reign of persecution was about to begin, to supply them with their needs. And as the deacon Lawrence took that responsibility so close to his heart, but he didn't think twice about taking the church's silver chalice and selling it and then using the money to help the poor in Rome. Well, guess what? After they sold the silver, news spread in Rome. And they brought in Marx and they wanted to know about this silver that was sold. So, here's what happened. An officer of the Roman Empire came to him and said, the emperor wants the treasures of the church. We heard that you sold silver. We want the treasure of the church brought to the emperor, and then we'll stop the persecution. And so Deacon Mark said, all right, I'm going to need time to gather all the treasures of the church. Uh, Rome's a big city. I'm going to need at least three days to gather the treasures of the church together. So he went out, and he wanted to have people stand with him in support. So he talked to the disabled. He talked to the poor. He talked to the needy in the church. He talked to the widows and the orphans. And he said, I need to meet before the procurator. Come with me. Come with me. Three days pass. He stands before the procurator, along with the gathering of the church. And the procurator looks at him and says, oh, wait a minute. I see you and I see these church members, but I don't see the bag of silver, and I don't see the bag of gold that I asked you for. You had three days to gather the treasures of the church, hand them over. And Deacon Marx goes, these are the treasures of the church. Well, things did not turn out well for Lawrence. You can go to his tomb today. It's one of the seven most popular places of pilgrimage in Italy. One of the great churches is built over his tomb. He was known for his wicked sense of humor. And as the story is told, they decided not to behead him. That was too easy. They decided they would grill him, literally. So they placed him under hot coals on a steel grill for hours, burning. And he didn't hold resentment or hate towards the soldiers who had to do this task, this horrible thing to see a person being burned alive. In his humor, the church reported that after a few hours of burning, he called to the soldiers and says, Gentlemen, I'm very well done on one side. You can turn me over now. <laughs> and that was recorded as his last words. A person of great generosity. Jesus said, we are the light of the world. You don't hide that light. 
under a bushel basket, he let that light shine. So St. Lawrence gathered the light of the church, the treasures of the church. And hundreds of people were there. And if you looked at them, what would you see? You'd see the hungry. You'd see unemployed. You'd see widows without social security. You'd see lepers without health insurance. You'd see the blind, the lame, the sick who were cared for by the church. And if you were Roman, what you saw was a bunch of outcasts and losers. But Deacon Lawrence saw children of God. The greatest treasures on earth. Same exact picture. Different eyes. Same exact people. Different hearts. And that is the power of a generous vision.